Pramadev Desai, practicing physician and a director of Lexus MD and Netflix. Today, we are going to discuss a very important issue on food mode connection. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Uma Naidu. Welcome, madam. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Desai. Yes, Thanks for having me. Real- it's a pleasure to have you and first of all i must thank you from the bottom of my heart that you accepted this invitation yes. to all our viewers dr uma naidu she is a harvard qualified psychiatrist nutritional specialist and also a professional chef she has many penned down her book selling books and the last one was this is your brain on food which is a go to guide book for any mental health for with the food she has appeared in the wall street journal in boston globe in group and also she is appearing regularly on abc news and today she has been given many best uh, designations but one of the one which is given by david bowley who is one of the famous french cuisine experts and she said that madam is a triple threat because of her medical background because of her nutritional background and also because she is a professional chef but madam i think i would call it a triple treat rather than triple threat so i just think that you have traveled a path which hardly people travel so what prompted you and who, what inspired you to start this unique field thank you for asking the question you know i um, grew up in a very large indian family and um as as many of us know many of us call or understand that there's often i was always encouraged by my parents and my mother is a double boarded physician herself she's now retired but she was in medical school when i was born so i spent the day time with my grandmother my maternal grandmother to whom my book is dedicated and she would be preparing for the large family so i'd watch her and i'd be with her and i learned you know to pick fresh vegetables to help her prepare i would be shelling peas and doing all sorts of little things i was very little but it obviously came with me that interest that love of food the joy around food family nurturance but also discussions about science nutrition um around the dinner table or around the lunch table and there was also uh many of my uncles and aunts who were training to be allopathic doctors but a couple of ayurvedic practitioners so there was also this discussion around um ayurvedic practices so when i ended up tr- deciding to choose psychiatry i brought those interests with me and i felt that medications while they are life saving to many people also have serious side effects metabolic side effects and several several others so although they do save lives and they are very important and i do still prescribe medications i felt that patients in mental health needed more tools in their toolkit and that just you know medicine the way that it is practiced in the west does not provide those um now i would say that there's more mind body medicine involved even at harvard at mass general we have the beds and henry institute which is about that mind body connection um they teach meditation they do lots of courses like that but there wasn't this gap the missing gap was food and i began to ask questions of my patients and really look more into that field and i think those of us who are medical practitioners on the call no on the app today know that um we don't really learn enough about nutrition in medical school so i chose to undertake that when i moved away and i needed to learn how to cook that that came to me and i found a real joy and a very creative space and a space of mindfulness when i was around food and i paid attention to that at that time that my love for nutrition and what i was studying mental health and the culinary arts would come together but it really began to be the way i was talking to patients in addition to everything else and then i was given the opportunity to my mentors at mass general to start this clinic and that really gave it um much more of a, a forward uh, forward thrust into the world and that was one of the ways in which my book came to be so it's a very long story but but it starts with my yeah. my origins and my family and and that's how it came to be yeah for the viewers dr naidu is the first person who started this psychiatry services in entire usa madam what is the scope of nutritional psychiatry in india according to you i think there's a lot of hope for it the reason i think it's so important is because metabolic health has become so important and covid has taught us that those with pre-existing conditions 
um, those with, you know, type 2 diabetes, uh, very, very, pre very, very prevalent in, in, in our culture, in our population, all of those be became much harder for the individuals uh, during COVID. So in addition to that, we know that inflammation through research is the basis of many conditions in mental health. And one of the ways inflammation is impacted is through how we eat. Because if we are eating pro-inflammatory foods, fast foods, junk foods, processed foods, ultra-processed foods, tons of sugar, added sugar in our food, that sets us up for inflammation. So I feel that there's a huge scope if people are interested. Um, I would hope that they are, and I hope that they would start to incorporate some of this. And certainly I'm starting to set up education and training. Yeah, right. Very important, madam, because I'm a practicing physician. Right. Though I'm not a diabetologist, my every second patient is a diabetes, yes. having diabetes, and where yeah. nutrition comes a big way. Will you some elaborate about the gut-brain axis and okay. the role of Vegas now in the super highway by diabetes? Of course. So, you know, if, if you went to medical school one and a half to two decades ago, you were not learning about the gut microbiome because it wasn't in the current science. It's really in the last one and a half to two decades that it emerged. And the, the microbiome, uh, the term the microbiome was sort of coined in 1995. But now we understand that this gut microbiome is almost, some physicians are even considering it an organ of its own. Where it impacts mental health is that the gut-brain connection also explains the food-mood connection because the gut and brain, uh, if you take us back to embryology plus, originate from the very same neural crest cells, and then they form these two organs. Then the vagus nerve up to the cranial nerve connects to, uh, connects from the brain to the gut and the gut to the brain. So you have that bi-directional flow of chemical messages that helps us understand this further. And then two more things I like to talk about are the fact that right now we should be aware, and I, as doctors we know this, but not the, the lay public tend not to know this, is 70% of our immune system is in the gut and 90% of the serotonin and the receptors are in the gut. So that also explains when you prescribe a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac or fluoxetine, sertraline, um, many patients will first and foremost experience gastrointestinal distress or side effects. It's, it's also because of the location of the receptors. So when people start to understand that these two organs are connected and that the breakdown products of food can be either positive products or more toxic products. So very, really, very simply, and I break it down and I include the research in my book, um, when you're eating a healthier, healthier meals, you get better breakdown products such as short chain fatty acids, which are actually going to reach the brain and have positive effects. If someone starts to go down the road of a fast food, processed food, junk food diet, that tends to set up the gut for the gut microbiome for inflammation. And that's when you do see over time an uptick of anxiety, depression, mental health symptoms. So that's very simply the connection in a nutshell, but it also explains how the food we eat is now a very sort of powerful tool in terms of how we feel. Right. Once I had a lecture on the antibiotics and I just raised the same question, but how many cells do we have in our body? Uh, yeah. The answer is 10 millions, 10 billions, and how many microbes we have? It's 100 trillions. So really the question is whether we live in microbes or microbes live in our body. Absolutely. That's absolutely yeah. true. And a lot of therapeutic uses are coming out with modulating the microbes, yes. microbiomes now, yes. yeah, including obesity also. Yes. Now we want to listen more about your book, This Is Your Brain Food. Absolutely. So the, the basis of the book is based on my clinical work. This particular, the food mood connection, or this is your brain on food, is based on my clinical work, but looking at the research. But it's based on the gut brain connection. Chapter one is called the gut brain romance because, like a romance, the gut brain connection, some days are good and some days are bad, but the connection is food. The bad days are related to not so healthy food that we may be eating. And it just it helps to get the message across to people. But it starts with that explanation. And then what I did is I looked at the most current research, which I update all the time on my Instagram handle and on social media because nutrition science changes all the time. The gut brain research and the studies are emerging all the time. Um, looked at the different mental health conditions and what are the foods that we should add into our diet. So there are many more foods we can add in, but what are the foods we need to be careful about, such as you know, people may not realize that saffron has a lot of good evidence for mood disorders. Um, 
people may also know that processed meats and certain processed foods that in certainly in the US have nitrates um, worsen depression. So, so little things like that become important for people to know when, they, when they're re-examining their diet. And their diet and how they're eating is a complementary method to anything else they're doing. Therapy is extremely important. Uh, medications can be life-saving for people. But that doesn't mean that you cannot be eating differently or in a more healthy way. And frankly, individuals who are following a healthier diet will also have the physical benefits of that on, their, on the rest of their health as well. Sarji, just a short question, madam. Uh, does the same food give different effects at different time, different season, or the, in the different genders? So, you know, the, I mean, that the research is not quite there yet. Certainly some research has been done on women and the Mediterranean diet uh, and that type of thing. And the Mediterranean diet is the one that seems to be the most popular for showing good effects in, yeah. in mood and anxiety. But one of the guidelines I allow, say, so how I respond to even a healthy food may not be how you will respond. I once treated a mother and daughter. I was actually treating the mom, but the teenage daughter came with her to the session. This was before COVID. And they had an opposite reaction to the same healthy food. So, you know, even when you're biologically related to someone, your microbiome can respond quite differently. So I don't feel like our research is there yet, but I do think that some guidelines around this are the following. Unless someone at any age group has a food allergy or intolerance, same thing for children or the elderly. You can always try food. So unless you have celiac or non-celiac gluten um, sensitivity or yeah. some sort of allergy like peanuts, you know, then, then you have to be careful about that food. But if not, why not try to include as many of those foods in your diet? And I think that as the research continues, we'll know more about the different age groups and that type of thing. Uh, Madam, we know as a medical person, when we prescribe that we are very careful about the drug-drug interactions. So mm -hmm. are there also food-food interactions or we should be avoiding some food with contradictory effects? So that's a good question. But, you know, I think that the, the, the ones that we learned in psychopharmacology and in pharmacology are the ones to remember. So I always say to people, the reason I say discuss your dietary changes or your nutrition changes with your doctor is your doctor knows the medications you are taking. For example, grapefruit, it's a healthy fruit. I would recommend that most people eat it. But depending on what medications you are, grapefruit interacts with certain liver enzymes and liver enzyme systems. So you have to, as a physician, be aware of that if someone comes to you and says, oh, you know, I've started having grapefruit juice every day. But if you're prescribing a medication that interacts. So I would say be guided by the ph pharmacology you've learned. And that's why I always say to people they have to involve their medical doctors in this because, you know, we study the psychopharmacology and the pharmacology behind medications. But, the, but in general, when you are pursuing just a change or improvement in your diet, you, you really should be guided by allergies and intolerance first and foremost. And also what I call body intelligence, which is if you eat a certain food, understand how it makes you feel. I'll give you an example. I was invited out uh, for dinner with friends the other day and they chose a Chinese restaurant and it was not one that I'd been to before. And I like Chinese food in general and I try to make healthier choices when I go there. But I developed a headache uh, about halfway through the meal. And that's very unusual for me. I'm not someone who has, but I, I thought it was directly related to the food and probably some content, whether it was the MSG or something else in the food yeah. that I was not used to because I hadn't been there before. So I think it's paying attention to to your yourself, your body, how it makes you feel is hugely important as well. Yeah. To the viewers, uh, Madam said that MSG is a mon monosodium glutamate. That's what we in our uh, teaching also say that uh, Chinese restaurant syndrome. Right. People go to the Chinese restaurant and get the headache. And especially if you are headache prone like migraine, then really right. have to got to inquire about this. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Now coming to your another best-selling book, food, more food connections. Something about the mood and food. Yes. Yeah, so, so in fact, the book is the same. Um, they just have different titles. The title in India is the Food Mood Connection. It's the same book that I was just speaking about. So it's outlined the same way. It's a soft cover in India. Um, and it follows much of the principles of nutritional psychiatry if you, if you want to learn them that way. They also have lists at the end of every chapter 
about foods to embrace and foods to avoid. So if you are, say, working with an individual with anxiety, it would be worth looking at those, those end notes because they give you guidance as to what you can tell um, your patients. And then Chapter 11 has recipes that you can share with them. Now, I happen to be vegetarian. I was raised that way. My family is vegetarian, but some of my family uh, does not, does, is not vegetarian. So I actually have recipes in the book where, you know, you can interchange the chicken that I'm talking about with a cauliflower steak, or you can make it um, friendly towards Indian food just by the spices you change, or say the vegetables or things like that, that you, that you interchange. And that becomes important in, in how you adapt things for different cultures and for different types of cuisine. I have heard, madam, that you are already fond of rainbow foods. So something about <laughs> the rainbow foods. <laughs> yes. So, so I talk about pillars of nutritional psychiatry, and one of them is, um, I'll, start off, I'll start off with that one. So eat the color of the rainbow. You know, when you see very, very colorful uh, fruit and vegetables, the different colors actually represent plant polyphenols, which are rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. So blueberries have anthocyanins, um, you know, the, the red bell peppers, green bell peppers, all of the colors of foods that we eat become important. And those antioxidants are extremely important for our gut because our gut microbes need two very important things. They need, they, they help those antioxidants work, but they also need fiber from those foods. And you don't get fiber from meat or seafood protein. You get fiber from plant-based sources such as vegetables, fruit, beans, nuts, lentils, legumes, seeds, and healthy whole grains. So we want to include the, the color of the rainbow for two reasons, the fiber as well as the antioxidant properties. Then another principle I talk about is eat whole, be whole. So think about, yeah. you know, the orange, you know, eat the orange, uh, uh, you know, instead of going to the, the store and buying the store-bought orange juice, because in the United States, our store-bought juices lack fiber, but they have a lot of added sugar. So the principle is, you know, just eat, eat the whole food, you know, cut it up, eat it, cook it, whatever it is, but don't go to the processed version of it, which would be the juice. Another one is, is the greener, the better. You know, we, uh, as Indians and Indian culture, we eat a lot of greens. and This is very healthy for us. So um, the, the, the more greens, whether they raw or cooked, the better. It, these are good for you because they contain folate. And folate, uh, low levels of folate are associated with depression and loss of brain cells. So there's a very healthy thing that you can do right there. So, you know, what that, those, these are some of the things that I try to encourage people to do. Uh, but I'm a little confused while going through the literature. Some mm -hmm. people believe that you should keep on changing your diet. Some people believe that you should be more consistent with your diet. So right. what's your take on that? You know, in, 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 the, in the U.S., I think that people are very, very confused by the diet wars, as I call them, because one day it's eat keto, another day it's be vegetarian or vegan or, you know, paleo, all these different terms. So I really feel that nutrition is, and certainly nutritional psychiatry doctors really going towards being highly personalized now. So everyone, like I mentioned that mother and daughter, everyone needs their own specific plan to actually feel better. And where, where I like to guide people is say, say you're choosing, you're choosing, you've spoken to your doctor, your nutritionist, and you're choosing to eat a ketogenic diet. Um, make sure that you're not missing out on entire food groups, because that balance becomes important, right? If, you know, maybe you're, if you're vegan, um, you may not be getting enough vitamin B12. So you might have to speak to your doctor about taking some supplementation there. So you, you, have, to, you have to balance things out. And I feel that people improve their mental well-being when they follow more of a consistent eating plan. They make slow and steady changes. You cannot give someone a list of 10 things to change overnight you know, give them one to two at a time and have them work their way up. So I actually believe it's not about one specific dietary change or another. It's about a, a, it's about a comprehensive, uh, what I call a holistic, functional and integrated plan in mental health to slowly and consistently adjust your diet so that those habits stick. And so that over time, these will not just be habits, but they become part of your lifestyle. Right. So I read that you just advocate 80-20 principles that 80% yes. should be considered 20% you can changing. With COVID pandemic, everybody's after boosting their immunity. 
and mm-hmm. many companies have also come out with the immune boosters and the alternative medicine also are coming with immune boosters so do we have foods which are boosting our immunity absolutely so you know i think the the thing with with covid and and understanding that you know the cytokine cytokine storm and this sort of some people had these abnormal responses in terms of their immune system with covid so what i like to talk about doctor is just improving almost improving where we are at so you don't necessarily have to boost the immunity but including foods that are rich in vitamin c are good for you anyway you don't have to take an excess amount of vitamin D C supplementation but you know you can eat citrus fruit you can eat lemons you can eat limes these are parts of things that are very much part of our food um vi- uh, vitamin C is very rich in kiwi fruit and in red bell peppers i wouldn't go eat an excessive amount of them use them as part of a balanced plan because you don't kind of want to overshoot that immune um immune response you just you want to keep it on an even keel So this is the mango season in India right now. So where do you plant mango? <laughs> so here's the thing. I love mangoes. Uh, mangoes are delicious. But one of the things I talk about in my book is the glycemic index, right? And tropical yeah. fruit, mang- mangoes are tropical fruit. Um they tend to be high on that glycemic index. So what I think about it is, you know, it's mango season. Ha- enjoy a piece of mango. Don't overdo it. Everything in moderation. If if you are struggling with your weight, if you are if you are have you know insulin resistance or you're developing type 2 diabetes or you're concerned about that then you have to be more careful about those fruits so berries like blueberries um uh, raspberries blackberries strawberries are slightly lower in the glycemic index and if you want a sweet um you know you have a sweet tooth or you're looking for healthier fruit those are better options for you so certainly when when you have problems with weight it it becomes an issue to only eat the pineapple and the mangoes the tropical fruit do tend to be um higher in the glycemic index so so it's about for finding that balance uh, another issue which uh, also there are confusing evidences and the literature is about intermittent fasting and it has become a very big fit fat these days so yeah. what do you yeah. think what how do we observe intermittent fasting and how does it help in the overall health as well as the mental health intermittent fasting is good for our physical health and those individuals again people should be speaking to their doctors because you may not know that you have problems with your blood sugar control and the most dangerous thing would be becoming hypoglycemic when you don't know it right so as doctors we know that and you want to therefore offer people guidance um what i say to people is the following if if you get up and you you know you you don't need to take medications first thing in the morning um and you're not feeling hungry you can eat later in the day and then if you're tolerating that well and your doctor thinks you can do it you know you might eat between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. and then you stop eating for the day you may sip water or drink you know um herbal teas or something like that and then you wake up the next day because that's sort of the overnight the overnight fast that you're doing it has to, again it comes back to this being personalized so speak to your doctor see how you know see how you tolerate this one of the things that i think intermittent fasting does is makes us more mindful of our food and it changes our relationship with cravings that's what that's that's what and, it, and what that's what the research has told us what we don't know yet is all of the impact in mental health anecdotally my patients will say they have less brain fog and they have more energy but again i think we need to do a little bit more research so in general i think intermittent fasting is is if it's if someone wants to do it check with their doctor it's a good idea there are many good health benefits i don't yet know all the health outcomes for mental health so uh, in short you will say that people who are diabetic heavily diabetic they should consult their doctors before resorting or, to intermittent fasting right or pre or pre diabetic or have problems with insulin resistance yeah. right because they yeah. drop their blood sugar suddenly and they don't know that could be dangerous so just discuss with their doctor the indians use lot of spices mm-hmm. these days so what is uh, their role in the mental health and does it really help in the mental health as well as the digestion absolutely you know so i think that one of the um one of the superfoods in 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 indian cuisine are the spices not only because they make food delicious but it turns out that you know turmeric uh capsaicin and chili peppers um and so many of the others have very strong when i say medicinal they actually have medicinal properties that also impact mental health 
So turmeric with a pinch of black pepper, it, it is shown that pepperine in black pepper activates the curcumin in the turmeric um, about 20-fold. So it's worth, even if you're making a, um, making a, a tea with your turmeric, adding in a pinch of black pepper is important to activate it. It's a strong anti-inflammatory, antioxidant properties. It has multiple different things that are useful. And it has been shown in multiple randomized controlled trials to help mood. So remembering that the effect is going to take time. So it will take at least a month before you notice anything. So being consistent about it, which I think is in easy for our sort of food because we, we cook a lot with it, right? And, and it's easy for us to work with turmeric and even add that to a tea. Um, and then there's the impact of uh, capsaicin from chili peppers. So we have, we have a whole, we have an armamentarium of positive um, uh, benefits of spices, which, which is as, as um, in the Indian culture, we should tap into. Another one is saffron. Now saffron, we don't use it as much of in a single dish, right? It's expensive and we use a few strands, but that's one where I say, speak to your doctor about a supplement because there's such good evidence of saffron supplementation and improvement in mood. Uh -huh. Madam, what matters the most in the food preparation? Is it the food? Is it the timing? It is the way we food or the quantity of food? Is it's the a, overall, what is more important? The most important, in my opinion, is rather than counting calories, it's the source of the food, right? So, so where are you getting your food? If you have access to it, and I know it's different in different countries, when you can, if you can, um, getting good quality vegetables, good quality fruit uh, becomes important. The, 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 I cannot stress the importance, whether it's eggs, whether it's milk that you're eating, whether it's, it's different forms of seafood, it's, the source becomes important because now we know a lot more about farming um, and that type of thing. I worry less about calories because I feel that if you're eating a healthier diet, you're including those vegetables or fruits, you're paying attention to fiber, in the United States, people are obsessed by the amount of protein they're eating, but we actually sincerely lack fiber in our diet. Only one in 10 Americans actually eats enough vegetables um, and fruits. So, so we are lacking fiber. And, and by including those slowly and steadily in your diet, you will definitely start to see uh, start to see improvement. Thank you so much, madam. Yes. Now, we have questions from the audience also. The relations between food and sleep and the importance of sleep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So sleep is, especially during the pandemic, people have really suffered with sleep so much so that some individuals call it Corona somnia. Um, and sleep definitely impacts mental health because poor sleep worsens depression. It can drive anxiety, it can do so many things. The thing about sleep is it, it's not just one thing. It's not just just sleeping. It's, it's, the whole, it's the whole pattern of what you're doing, how you're handling your day, what you're eating, what you're drinking. Um, and, and, and the level of your stress, for example. So you may be eating dinner earlier as a family and getting ready to, to go to bed, meaning you, you stop eating, you may drink um, decaffeinated tea or you may drink water, but you kind of getting your, and then shutting off your phones and your devices, 30 minutes to an hour before, notifications going off all the time. I know when I forget to shut off my notifications, my phone is buzzing throughout, you know, and, and I, it keeps interrupting me. People use things like blue blocking light uh, glasses and all sorts of things to help with encouraging sleep, but also becomes a food you eat, right? Relying on a glass of wine to help you sleep, ultimately that glass of wine is gonna disrupt your sleep architecture. That's very different to just having a glass of wine with dinner because that's something you enjoy. If you're not using it to help you sleep, that's very different. Of course, again, in moderation. Then coffee, you know, coffee having that and even tea, tea has, tea can keep you awake. So having it early in the day, switching to an herbal tea later in the day, um, making sure that if, if ca 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 caffeine keeps you awake, you, you maybe cut back a little bit on it. All of that becomes important. And then eating melatonin rich foods can be helpful. And I list some melatonin rich foods. Um, I, my, my favorite one, but not everyone eats eggs, is flipping breakfast for dinner because uh, eggs are rich in melatonin. So making an omelet for dinner can be something that I, I share with individuals that they can do if they eat eggs, but they're also vegetables that contain melatonin. Um, eggs having yeah. melatonin is a new learning for us. And I'm sure after this, uh, people would start <laughs> trying that. And we know that blue light of, the, yeah. blue light of uh, the mobiles have definitely 
inhibitory effect on the melatonin yeah yeah they do on. they absolutely yeah. do so yeah so so it's about changing all of those things in in uh, in unison we have certain craving for foods so what does that mean that was one of the questions asked sure you know they can mean many different things uh, and i definitely feel there's an association with stress many people over the times of covid were feeling very stressed and they were craving certain foods i have written about this but you know comfort foods that we see as comfort actually discomfort for the brain unfortunately because all the things that people turn to um that they they feel are comforting often they are high glycemic foods um sugar rich foods sometimes processed foods um sometimes extremely sweet foods like ice cream and candies and things like that so it's it, it becomes an important balance to understand where that comes from now interestingly intermittent fasting can sometimes help people with their craving so if if you have patients who are suffering with that and they are otherwise healthy and can tolerate a, a trying out a fasting window diet maybe that would be one way to think about it but my other trick about that is to try to think of foods that replace the unhealthy foods you are craving uh, another interesting question that some people stress uh, binge eating at night so how to overcome that mm-hmm. right so so binge so binge eating at night is sometimes brought on by eating not eating consistently during the day Do- you know doctors this happens to doctors because they're rushing the whole day and they not stopping for lunch and then they end up really hungry at night so partly it's making sure you're eating even if it's small meals throughout the day so that you're not starving in the evening another thing is managing your stress now that is very separate to binge eating as in an eating disorder because with eating disorders you really have to see an eating disorder specialist a psychiatrist who will help you repair that relationship with food or help that patient repair their relationship with food because until they can repair the relationship they can't change to a healthier food right so binging and purging or restricting food entirely and being underweight so so it's it's more complicated when it comes to eating disorders uh, another question about the vegetarian food versus the omnivorous diet is there a definite mm-hmm. scientific evidence of superiority of one over the other so here's here's where we get back into those diet wars right because certain studies will talk about and certain practitioners will talk about well a plant based diet is the only way to go you shouldn't be eating dairy you shouldn't be eating cheese you should only be vegan and plant that's what plant based means but at the same time you know other advocates of say um a more keto forward diet will say you you need the nutrients from meat you should be eating uh, red meat and other seafoods and that you you know that that's what your brain needs so this is what i'm i'm going to say to people it's more about the impact of how your gut microbiome is unique and it's more important the impact of what your diet is and how you can tweak it so if you are an omnivore then having a healthy version of the foods that you're eating becomes important for your mental health if you are vegetarian then having healthy you know a vegetarian diet can be pizza and coke you know a slice of pizza and a coca cola so so we have to be careful when we say these things that if you are a vegetarian diet that you're eating healthy foods that are going to improve your mental health and i would say that right now there isn't any definitive research to say that you have to be vegan or plant based but if you listen to certain doctors or certain authors or certain practitioners they will say very definitively you should be plant based i don't think we're there yet i think it really depends on what you're eating are there benefits of a plant rich diet absolutely so we talked about the 80 20 rule i also like people to mostly on their plate have vegetables and then a source of protein that they prefer it could be it could be um meat it could be seafood but could also be a plant based source of protein uh, i think that that becomes very important so i do i don't want to underscore i actually want to underscore the importance of plant rich foods in your in your overall balance because of the fiber and those nutrients i mentioned much earlier earlier when you were talking of diet really it was only in relation to the diseases or relation to weight loss or related to the recovery of the acute myocardial infarction or something but diet is probably mm-hmm. more than that and it's more have a value preventive value and modifying yes. our behavior and everything than only the diet absolutely 
Absolutely. Yeah. Modif- mod- behavior modification, stress management, exercise, movement, um, meditation, mindfulness, all of that becomes important. Yoga, I mean, you mentioned um, yoga. You know, there was a study from 2020 that looked at pranayama um, yoga and the effect on cardiac health, but it also showed an improvement in depression and anxiety. So, you know, these um, these the research is, is important to look at and it, it's showing us the way. Right. Uh, one interesting question was, what is the difference between nutritionist and dietitian? Really, the answer I had given partly there. <laughs> In the United States, um, there are a whole lot of different pathways to the studying. I, I don't I don't know how to differentiate that for you in India because I don't know how the training is. Um, I think that, you know, that's a very, very important part of uh, understanding our nutrition. I think that as a doctor, you know, understanding the, the, the physiology, the anatomy of the body, the biochemistry and the pharmacology also helps. Um, but I think that they play a very important role in um, helping patients with figuring out how to uh, how to eat better. There is a question on the low FODMAP diet for the people right. with gut issues. It's also right now in the Absolutely. Research. It certainly can be helpful for individuals with gut issues. Um, I think that understanding that when someone has gut issues, getting to the root cause of that becomes important. And one of the causes is diet and is how we're eating because certain foods can be more inflammatory in the gut um, and disruptive to those gut microbes. Um, So starting to work with someone on eating gut healing foods becomes important. So I think it certainly works for those individuals and they should be speaking to their gastroenterologist about following that following that more carefully. Uh, another question is, is it really helpful to take salad of special vegetable or locally grown vegetable as a better so, option? So, you know, locally grown, a lot of people would argue is probably better um, if you have access to your own garden or uh, organic produce um, where you live. That's always a great option because if you're buying something in a store in a supermarket or a market, it's been transported from somewhere. So definitely, uh, if, if you have access to that, good for you and maybe try that. Uh, Naidu, would you suggest uh, the patients who are suffering from depress- depression to avoid certain foods? Yes. So, the, so those are the foods that I list in my, I list in my book. And, and what some of the things that they want to be careful are those so, um, very processed and ultra processed foods and junk foods because the processed uh, in- the ingredients that make them processed are not good for the brain and they disrupt the gut. Another category is the added and refined sugars. So a lot of savory foods are very high in sugar. Um, Things like ketchup, things like salad dressing, pasta sauces, um, actually have a lot of added sugar that you don't realize. So being careful about um, where you buy, what you're buying, looking at the food label, seeing the amount of sugar becomes important. Um, And then processed vegetable oils becomes important. So if you you or your children like fast foods and, you know, the fast food restaurants that we have in the U.S. tend to use a lot of processed vegetable oils, which can be very inflammatory for the gut and setting up for inflammation and then worsening of symptoms. And the other category, in addition to trans fats, um, is artificial sweetness. So if you're trying to cut back on sugar, be careful of the no sugar, low sugar versions because they might have artificial sweetness, but I list these in my book as well. Uh, Madam, we talk a lot about the microbiome. So are there any specific foods or prebiotics that can help uh, improving our microbiome? Absolutely. So um, there are, you know, supplements you can take, but I would rather start with food first. I mean, I think there is a place for supplementation um, because our diets are not perfect, but for, for prebiotics, you can get this through food. Um, asparagus, be, um, beans, oats, bananas, just to name a few, um, are rich in prebiotic fiber. And uh, probiotics you can get from a supplement, but you can eat fermented foods, kimchi, miso, pickles, kombucha, kefir, uh, are just to name a few of uh, the fermented foods that, that uh, actually help the gut microbes uh, by bringing back live active cultures. So those are great ways to go. Plus, remember, the fiber-rich foods that I mentioned, the fruit, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, lentils, legumes, and the healthy whole grains also provide fiber for the gut microbiome. 
Yeah, we also advise our patients to take card and buttermilk because they also have rich in lactobacillus. That's right, they're rich in probiotics. Can food work as a placebo? That was an interesting <laughs> question. You know, I think that anything can work as a placebo, right? Because that's related to your mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, quite possibly for some people, maybe a placebo. But I think that it's also if you followed and seen people clinically who are adjusting and making nutritional changes. Um, that they start to improve their mood scores, they have lowered anxiety, improvement in OCD and other symptoms. It becomes important. So, of course. Thank you very much, yes. Dr. Naidu, for all your time and efforts and enlightening us. And it's, it was really a great pleasure to have you us on our platform. Thank you very I'm much. Happy.